Final Fantasy VI arrived at a time when video games were well and truly on the rise. Whereas the Famicom had ushered in a new era, removing the damage done by the famed video crash, the era that followed, which included the Super Famicom, helped to cement that video games were now a stable medium. This security, combined with the extra horsepower provided by 16-bit consoles, allowed video game developers to experiment. This affected almost everything, from the fidelity of the graphics and music through to the sheer scope of the games themselves. And by the end of that particular generation, we got to see the culmination of that experimentation with games like Final Fantasy VI. It was also during this generation that developers realised that they needed to start marketing themselves as people, raising their profiles so that consumers would be invested in the products they made. It saw Hironobu Sakaguchi and Nobuo Uematsu thrust into the spotlight, and in the build-up to Final Fantasy VI, other members of the team also became involved with promotional activities, often teaming up with prominent Japanese publications to create authentic and supplemental content that would help to enrich the experience for those who ended up purchasing the game. All things considered, it's what makes Final Fantasy VI a fascinating game to explore in more detail, and today we're going to run through some pretty obscure details about the game that we hope you'll find insightful on multiple levels, beyond just the headline. So, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more high quality Final Fantasy content, and from an unusual vocal track that would have stunned audiences, through to an entire comic strip that was created in preparation for the game's launch, let's run through some facts about Final Fantasy VI in our typical granular style that we're pretty confident you still didn't know. Before we do though, if you're interested in pre-ordering your copy of The Legacy of the Crystal, our encyclopedic book that will contain chronological information about 135 games related to the Final Fantasy franchise, make sure you do so soon, as the pre-order store is planned to close within the next month. To find out more, head to Backerkit, there's a link in the description below. As we just covered within our Summon Evolutions video, the concept of calling forth mythical beasts to aid the party in combat was introduced in Final Fantasy III thanks to a combination of the Evoker, Summoner and Sage jobs. At that time, the most powerful summon was Bahamut, and that continued to be the case when the concept of summoning returned in Final Fantasy IV and V. But perhaps due to how much of an expansion there was for summons in Final Fantasy VI, the developers decided to make some pretty significant changes. Summons would become known as espers, and they had a strong integration with the wider story, with Terra appearing as a half-esper, and many others obtained by the acquisition of Magicite. The Magicite would allow players to summon espers in combat, but it could also be used to teach playable characters numerous abilities. Bahamut would again appear as one of the most powerful espers available for players to wield, costing 86 MP to deal non-elemental damage to all enemies using Mega Flare, a move that had a spell power of 92. But unlike previous games, Bahamut was not the ultimate summon. Valley Garmander, for example, could perform Tri Disaster, a move that had a spell power of 110, but its usage would be hindered by its damage being elemental, meaning the real super summon was Crusader. Crusader could only be obtained after defeating the eight legendary dragons, and from a narrative perspective, it was said to contain a fragment of the power housed within the Warring Triad. This explains then why Crusader deals non-elemental damage to a move called Cleansing, which had a spell power of 190, a considerable high up from Mega Flare. The downside for wielding that power was that Crusader would not just target enemies when summoned, it would also target allies. Including Crusader as a super summon would then set an interesting precedent, as in subsequent games, Bahamut would again be replaced by a more powerful summonable entity of incredible power that was unlike anything else seen within that game or the franchise up until that point. Final Fantasy VII, for example, would see the appearance of Knights of the Round, whereas Final Fantasy VIII would feature Eden, and Final Fantasy IX would have Ark appear as the ultimate summon. Now, localization has always been an interesting part of the Final Fantasy experience, as depending on where you're based in the world, you could have characters called completely different things, with their names also pronounced in completely different ways. This affected the original Final Fantasy, and it still happens today, with Final Fantasy XV having the classic naming misalignment related to Cindy, or Sydney, depending on where you're from. But what's interesting is that this quirk affected Final Fantasy VI more than many of the other games, with numerous main characters having their names changed, as well as quite a few NPCs. The most well-known name change is present with Terra, who in the Japanese version was called Tina, and the reason as to why this change happened is an interesting nugget in itself. 
To Japanese gamers, a name like Tina was exotic and more fantasy, as it's a very uncommon name within their culture, but in North America, the exact opposite is true. And according to Ted Woolsey, who was in charge of localizing Final Fantasy VI, during initial playtests in North America, almost every single individual hated seeing the name Tina associated with a character who was meant to be the main protagonist in a fantasy game. It's why they ended up changing her name from Tina to Terra, so that gamers in North America would still get that same level of intrigue as Japanese gamers. Other names, which just sounded better in Japanese, also got changed, with the prominent example being Sabin Figaro, who in the Japanese version was referred to as Mashu. After determining that someone called Mash in the English version wouldn't sound that cool, they decided it would be best to change it to Sabin instead. NPCs were also affected by those two same considerations. The Japanese version had characters such as Billy and Jeff, who had their names changed for the North American version due to the ability for characters to change the names of the protagonists. They felt that names like Billy and Jeff were far too common within the general public, and they wanted to avoid a situation where players could rename Locke, for example, to Jeff, and then have Jeff meet Jeff. As such, Billy was renamed to Baram, and Jeff was renamed to Gerard. Two NPCs that had Japanese-inspired names were also changed to be more in line with the fantasy aesthetics used for the rest of the names featured in the game, so Mina became Elaine and Shun became Owen. By the time Final Fantasy VI had released, there had been countless pieces of armour created for the various characters to wear, and by adding weapons to the equation, even though some had started to be recycled due to their significance, there were hundreds upon hundreds of unique pieces of gear created. To help keep things interesting, this gear would often have restrictions placed on who it could be wielded or worn by. In the earlier games, this would be based on jobs, with Final Fantasy IV then introducing gear that was exclusive to certain genders. But none of that would hold a candle to an equipment set introduced in Final Fantasy VI that still remains very unique, even to this day. The imp equipment could be found throughout the world of Ruin by an assortment of methods that included drops, steals, metamorphing and gambling. And what made them unique was that they could only be equipped by someone if they had been afflicted by the imp status effect. This was a new status effect introduced in Final Fantasy VI, and those afflicted would see all non-core abilities disabled, all magic except imp disabled, and all weapons and armour having their stats reduced to 1. The main way to circumvent this would be to either cure the status effect, or don the very powerful imp set, which included the Impartisan, Tortoise Shield, Sorcerer, and Reed Cloak. The Impartisan, for example, would have more attack power than both Mog and Edgar's ultimate spears, while the Tortoise Shield would have more defense and magic defense than the Paladin Shield. Even though Imp has appeared sporadically throughout the franchise, with the most recent iteration being in Final Fantasy XIV when squaring off against Ultros and Typhoon at Dragon's Neck Coliseum, the mechanic relating to the Imp equipment set has never been used again, and it remains unique to Final Fantasy VI. Another unique element found within Final Fantasy VI was Gogo. Unlike many of the other characters featured in the rather bulbous cast, Gogo was introduced for the sole reason of providing some unorthodox gameplay utility. This was noted by Yoshinori Kitase when speaking to Kotaku back in 2017, as he said that Final Fantasy VI's two optional characters, Gogo and Umaro, actually did not carry any backstory. They were just there for you to select if you wanted them to be in the battle. In the final game, Gogo could be acquired in the World of Ruin, and only after being inhaled by the Zone Eater. Once inside, as well as finding numerous relics and pieces of armour, the party would encounter Gogo. But unlike the previous game, where to unlock the mime job, the party would need to outfox the famed mimic Gogo, in Final Fantasy VI, players just had to navigate their way through the dungeon, speak with Gogo, and explain their situation. In the grand scheme of things, this was pretty straightforward and simple, assuming you knew what to do. But in earlier drafts of the game, the method for acquiring Gogo was meant to be very different. The plan was for Gogo to be found inside a pub once the World of Ruin had been formed. Gogo would move location based on a hidden timer, and the only way to find Gogo would be to look inside the pubs for one of the party members that wasn't in your active party, as Gogo would be appearing in disguise. If the player spoke to this character, they would get an unexpected response, hinting that something wasn't right, and the player would then need to change their party, include the real character, and confront the imposter. Only then would the big reveal happen, with Gogo joining the party as a consequence. With hindsight, even though the concept was quite lavish, 
The developers felt it would place too much onus on the player to try and figure out what was going on, especially with Gogo also changing location and disguise. So they reduced everything down in scale and made the acquisition of Gogo much more simple by comparison. In the modern landscape of Final Fantasy, vocal tracks have become a staple of the soundtrack. The most recent entries outside of Final Fantasy XIV have chosen to just license existing pieces of music, but there was once a time when Nobuo Uematsu wrote compelling ballads that either pulled on the heartstrings and caused the majority of players to break down in tears, or simply attempted to strike fear into them. The latter notion is of course a reference to One Winged Angel, which was the first piece of music in the franchise to use real vocals. But that's not to say there weren't attempts made with Final Fantasy VI, and a vocal track was even written, performed, and recorded, it just wasn't ever released in the final product. At this point, I'm sure you're all thinking this relates to the opera sequences, and it's true, Uematsu was desperate to have the piece of music related to the opera feature real vocals, but he was thwarted by the limitations of the Super Famicom sound chip, and was instead forced to simulate vocals by using synthesized voices. Still an impressive feat though, that did not take away from the impact of the scenes at all. This fact though instead relates to another piece of music called Chikazuku Yokan, or Approaching Sentiment. Around the time that Final Fantasy VI was releasing in Japan, Square teamed up with V-Jump magazine to create a ton of promotional content, and one piece was pretty special, a VHS tape containing numerous sequences, with members of the development staff talking about the various characters and events that would take place in the final game. But even though that was all pretty fascinating, the highlight of the video was its conclusion. It saw the entire staff of Final Fantasy VI band together to perform a song that was composed by Uematsu, had its lyrics written by Hiroyuki Ito, and had Uematsu performing as the lead singer, with the rest of the crew performing background and chorus vocals. What you're seeing right now is footage from that video, and a big thanks needs to go to Gorecab, who took the time to import the VHS tape to a modern format, and then preserved it by uploading the video to YouTube. If you'd like to check out the full version, there's a link in the description below. But for now, why not have a listen to a small sample? Even though Approaching Sentiment did not appear on the original soundtrack, it was released to the general public a few weeks after the launch of Final Fantasy VI on an arrangement album called Final Fantasy VI Special Tracks. Alongside this amazing vocal track, the album also included a few unreleased town themes, an enhanced version of Troy and Beauty, and a few remixes. For our next fact, we're going to stick with the theme of promotional assets that were created as part of Square's collaboration with V-Jump. In January 1994, a few months before the release of Final Fantasy VI, the game featured a huge spread in V-Jump magazine. There were numerous screenshots featured, each of which ended up being quite changed in comparison to what was seen within the final game, and they were accompanied by descriptions of what was going on, typical stuff you'd expect to see from a preview. But what wasn't expected was that the preview was accompanied by numerous original assets that were drawn by Tetsuya Nomura, as well as an illustrator called Rinko Yano. For Nomura's part, some of the more prominent characters like Terra and Locke had specific bios, and he drew chippy versions of their characters to help make them stand out. It's also interesting that Mog was given some prominence, even though his role was quite muted within the final game. Yano was then given the task of creating a Final Fantasy VI comic strip. This again featured Terra, Locke, and Mog as they fought against soldiers. Various scenes from the actual game were then integrated alongside the action, some of which reused assets from Final Fantasy V, and the whole idea was that the comic strip would attempt to explain some of the mechanics and abilities that would feature within the final product. And that brings us on to our final fact of the video, that Final Fantasy VI was meant to be released on the PC over a decade before its eventual release on Steam. Even though Square had started out developing games for personal computers, they had long since abandoned that line of development by the time that they became household names on a global scale. But after taking a risk and commissioning Eidos to produce a PC port of Final Fantasy VII, they were surprised by its performance and committed to taking the same approach for not just Final Fantasy VIII, but also Final Fantasy V and VI. Not only would this allow Final Fantasy VI to be played on a different system outside of the Super Famicom, it would have also represented a chance for North American players to play Final Fantasy V after its localised port was scrapped when it was near completion. Unfortunately, things did not pan out though. Final Fantasy VIII on PC was not anywhere near as well received as the port of Final Fantasy VII, 
with numerous publications stating that it was even inferior to the PlayStation version, and Eric Walpore of Computer Gaming World even saying that it was the laziest console translation ever. It's unclear if Final Fantasy VIII was the straw that broke the camel's back, but the working relationship between Eidos and Square ended not too long after, and it meant the proposed ports of Final Fantasy V and VI were cancelled, and there was no PC release for Final Fantasy IX. Square would still re-release Final Fantasy VI around the world on the PlayStation as part of various collections including the aptly named Final Fantasy Collection in Japan and the Final Fantasy Anthology, but the original version would never receive a PC port. Instead, Square Enix chose to port the Android version to Steam in 2015, and in more recent times, Final Fantasy VI has been re-released as part of the Pixel Remaster collection. And with that, I think we're done. They were another 7 facts about Final Fantasy VI that we are pretty confident that you still didn't know, and as always we threw in a load of little bonus facts for good measure. Having said that, we're pretty sure there are still some amongst you who knew them all. But let us know in the comments below which you found to be the most interesting, and of course, if you enjoyed the video, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl, signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Anthony Hoffman, Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Eric Chris, C. Dollaret, and Gregory, who are super special Onionite supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.